Hi, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just kind of quick introduction for Jonathan. Um, he's obviously a very well-known, um, respected author uh, of a book and journalist in Germany. So, you know, without going obviously into, into all the details, I think everybody's kind of seen it. Um, this book specifically, Mensch Beyond the Cones, is, it's kind of outlines the overall um, aspects of German football from, you know, the coaching education platform to academies, to training grounds, um, you know, kind of also, I think, you know, reading the book and I, and I highly recommend all of you guys as well, if you have a chance to read it, I know he also has a, um, you know, audio version of it on Spotify as well. I think it's uh, very comprehensive and gives a really good idea of, you know, what are the different aspects and challenges of, of German football um and and also you know kind of the title says it really um beyond just the coaching the tactics um and diving a little bit more into the human element of it which ultimately is the underlining factor of everything that you know is is going on and, and some of the challenges and also some of the progress that um obviously german football has made over the last 10-15 years um after the struggles uh you know in major tournaments and stuff like that so um, yeah, with that, I guess, John, I'll just start with you, pass it on to you, and we can kind of go from there. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to, uh, to speak to so many people. And uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, I said to, to Shahad and to Paul that I would like to keep it relatively informal. Um, if for anybody who's read the book, feel free to ask me any questions. If you haven't read the book, then also feel free to ask me any questions. Um, I want it to be more of a conversation than a presentation per se. I always find that a little bit more exciting and a bit more stimulating than me just sitting here like, a, like at school and telling you something at the end of the day. I'm not here to tell you something you don't know. Um, I'm here to just provide you with the knowledge that I've learned in the hope that it might inspire you to do something you've always wanted to do, maybe in a different way in coaching. So as I say, looking forward to it. Jonathan, um... Start starting off. I mean, what, how, how would you describe starting off Germany as a country? You know, as far as the soccer, how would you, how would you begin that, that description? I think German football has really developed rather rapidly over the last twenty years. If we consider what it was like at the start of two thousand, okay, they made the World Cup final in two thousand two, but that was more fortune than I would say planning. Um, that was an aging team, slightly broken in many parts, basically lifted by a couple of individuals. I think the performance in Euro 2000, Indeed. they realized that it was pretty terrible. Um, and they needed to um, make severe changes. Uh, and that was the introduction of, of academies. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I felt like, looking back, you realize that the introduction of academies is kind of the, the changing point. They realized that their football was reliant on the kind of traits that often people associate with England a few years ago, you know, this like hard hitting, we're aggressive in the tackle, we're all about motivation. There wasn't very much technical focus, you know, there wasn't very much individual um, focus in terms of development. That certainly changed. Uh, they made big changes at domestic level. Clubs had to have academies. Um, and basically the win in Brazil 14 years later was the result of what they did in after 2000 so it's kind of a 14 year cycle um and that is in many respects in football quite a short amount of time for something to go from terrible to top of the world um they then i would say paid the price for complacency and arrogance in that position and are now in the process of recovering from that um and have fortunately landed on a coach that has a very clear idea of how he wants to move the team forward. So I think the evolution of German football has been not that great to look at, but uh, effective to an extremely attacking, appealing set of players in a team that almost everybody else in Europe wanted to emulate around 2014. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that's changed too much in terms of the individual players but the damage that was done three years ago in Russia certainly changed 
who was top of the castle, who was top of the mountain, as it were, in terms of development. Uh, I think France and England have taken a few strides past Germany in that time. I think German football is still in a great place. They have the fortune of having a number of talented players still coming through. There are focus areas on youth development in the country to make sure that that, for want of a better phrase, production line continues um, because they don't want players in specific areas or with specific abilities to stop appearing. Um, but I, yeah, I think the last 20 years is kind of very interesting in terms of German football development because of the rapid amount of change that's happened within that time period. They've gone from outside of the top of the top 10, basically, to being top, to falling out and now building their way back. Um, and the effect of the first team and the performance of the first team affects everything all the way down to under 19s, under 16s, uh, youth football in Germany, the development of that. Um, everything is affected by the way that the first team plays. So it's been interesting to see the trickle down effect and the changes that were made. Um, I think it's an exciting time again for Germany after a bit of a difficult time. But I think German football after 2014 has always been something people have been interested in, whether it be coaching or their style of play um, or because of coaches like Jurgen Klopp. Um, the way that the sport has changed modern perception of Germany as well is, uh, is not to be underestimated. I remember that game against Brazil so mm. vividly in 2014 where they absolutely demolished Brazil. <laughs> um, so, so leading up to 2014, what, what mm. was going on for that, for that generation of players mm. and what led to that, that kind of performance? Well, Love had, so I think the starting point for that generation really was probably 2006. So Klinsmann was in charge. They had the home world cup. It was a huge turning point in terms of German pride. I think having flags out on the street was really a massive turning point for Germany because that's not something that had happened for a very long time. People were not sure how to feel about supporting Germany. And they did such a good job of effectively overperforming at that World Cup. But they, the performance there, I think you had the beginnings of 2006, 2006, 2008, at the beginnings of the spine of the team. You know, you had Lahm, you had Schweinsteiger, you had Podolski. These were key players. They were integral parts of the way that the team looked in terms of the makeup, but also the character of the team. And I think by the time you know, 2012 came around. That was probably the missed opportunity there. I think they were primed to win that Euros. I think Love learned his biggest coaching lesson um, by making adjustments based on the opposition against Italy that ultimately cost him uh, when he should have just played the way that they were playing before because it was so successful. I think he got too much in his own head at that point. You know, Germany on a whole... Um, suffered from the fact that they were also playing at the same time as one of the greatest teams to ever play. And that was Spain in 2008 and 2010. You know, if Spain are not around, Germany probably win another tournament or two. So that's not to be forgotten. But I think those losses um, in a final in 08, um, in a semi-final in 2010, I think they were formative because Germany recognized that they were very close and they narrowly lost both of those games. Uh, and I think they knew... If Spain, Spain would stop being so dominant at one point, I would have loved to have seen them play Spain in the 2012 final. I think they may well have gotten the edge there. So I think by the time the 2014 came around, they knew it was it. You know, I think often teams and coaches have a feeling for, okay, this is very much our time, and if we don't do it now, then it will never happen. Um, and I think the way that that group had, had gone through difficult losses um, I think it was aware that this was kind of a make or break situation. You know, a lot of people say, well, if they don't beat Algeria, the dream is over. Absolutely. That was a, a very scary game. But again, formative moments in a tournament after that, that win, Per Mertesacker, the former Arsenal defender who was playing in the German national team at that time, was interviewed. And he gave a very stirring press conference where he effectively said, you know, what do you think? Do you think bad teams come to this World Cup? You know, he was very angry because the question was, why this isn't Germany? You know, you only just scraped through against Algeria. And he said, look, we won the game. You know, we rest and we cover and we go again. And I think the frustration he allowed his emotion to be showed, that the emotion that he revealed was important for the team. 
he said he got back on the on the bus or the plane and everyone was you know cheered him on and said well done you know we needed everyone to know that and there were these small steps along the way that really brought the team closer together you know you win that game then you narrowly beat France ironically France were then on their own way after losing that game to their own victory later on everybody's progressing at different levels and in many respects the semi-final was the final I think everybody in the Germany camp thought once they had won that game and they'd basically taken the heart of the host nation, there was no way they were not going to lose. They were, there was no way they were going to lose the final. So, so many small moments along the way, so many formulative moments in developing a team in previous tournaments. Love had clearly adapted the way that he wanted to play football and his method of playing football, largely a little bit possession-based at that point, was right for that time. Uh, he had taken a, definitely a cue from the Spanish, but had been keen to have dynamic moments in the final third. And he had the right set of players. Uh, it all came together just when he needed it to. Um, what happened after that is a different story. But um, 2014, definitely a culmination of years of work at the DFB in, after 2000, but also years of work from Lerv and his players in terms of building upon uh, performances in tournaments before then and making sure that it was their time to uh, to win it was in embodied by Bastian Schweinsteiger in the final you know he was the one who iconically had blood on his face and was still fighting even though he had cramp and I think that will always go down as an iconic image but it was also definitely a moment in which it was clear that he knew Lam knew Mertesacker knew a lot of the players in that team knew that they were never going to be back here um, and so I think the great players make sure that they don't let those opportunities go. It's now or never. Indeed. How much, uh, I, I don't want to hog the question, so Shahad or anyone else, please, but how much, how much influence do you think Pep had on that German national team? Because he had probably, you said they took a cue from Spanish football mm. and he had been at Bayern for how long at that point? I mean, he'd been there long enough. Um, I, I think it's not to underestimate Pep Guardiola's influence on all football, but particularly in Germany. I think the biggest thing he changed was that German managers, I think, in the past felt that they had their tactics, they had their, their formation, they had their approach. And the game started and that was it. You know, you were going to see that through. You maybe make adjustments here and there. But basically, we're going to play 4-4-2. We're going to play a low block. Uh, I want to play out wide when we get the opportunity to play on the break. Thanks very much. Um, Pep basically gave everyone else permission to change tactics during the game. And I think that was kind of a revelation because I think originally German coaches thought that was an admission of failure. If I have to change something, I must have done something wrong originally. What Pep did effectively was tell people, no, Football is a constantly evolving and changing sport. You're just keeping up with what's happening in the game. You're adapting, you're changing. And so that was a huge influence on German football because coaches realized that 20 minutes in, if things weren't working, you could swap to a 4-3-3. And so long as you had coached your players and they were aware that that kind of alteration was possible, it happened. Um, I also think he changed, particularly at Bayern, <clears throat> who were already quite a ruthless team. I think he brought in this idea of severe ruthlessness where you could not just pass your way out, but you've scored four, score seven. You know, there's never enough. You know, if, if your opposition is beaten, if your opposition is down, keep going. And I think that definitely instilled what has always been at the club, this Ziga mentality, which is the German word for sort of the winning mentality that is existing at Bayern Munich and Germany has always been built by a core set of players from Bayern Munich. So the filtration is quite obvious uh, when it comes to the national team. I think those two things changed German football forever. I think he gave a lot of coaches permission to do things they wouldn't have otherwise done. And I think he instilled a deeper level of ruthlessness in, in some of the top players that ended up playing for Germany. And I think that has then spread. And now, if you look at the Bayern Munich teams of today, I don't think a player like Joshua Kimmich has the tenacity that he has now if it weren't for Pep. And he's bringing that into the national team, or has done for a few years as well. 
Um, I think 2014 was still, in terms of character, was still built off players like Schweinsteiger. I don't think that's too much pep there. But I think the permission to make changes and alterations definitely something that influenced Germany and, and German football as a whole. Yeah. I know, um, like for me, the like the the positional play that Pep brought was, you know, probably the the lessons that a lot of these younger coaches have got a hold of. Mm. You know, the Nailsmans, the the other ones, teams that are playing more in a positional game than in a transitional game, and then combining the both of them, yes, the lethal effect, right. Yeah, I mean, that is the challenge. I think German football, when Jurgen Klopp and Thomas Tuchel, probably formative after Ranić, I think it starts probably with Ralph Ranić teaching people how to play the back four in, I want to say, the 90s. Um, feels like a long time ago. Could have been later than that. <laughs> um, but I think he changed German football a lot. And I think he's probably the the tree if you like you know the root of almost all other german coaches of the modern era they've taken something out of his book i think transitional football became very popular in the public sense in sort of the broader sense through um jürgen klopp's Borussia dortmund i think he really brought this you know like he you know heavy metal football that's what he used to like to call it i think he gave German football a cue as if to say this is the way to play extremely wild and attractive football. I think a lot of other coaches took that. Uh, Thomas Tuchel likes a little bit more control, um, but I think there were formulative moments, formulative coaches along the way. Uh, I think Pep definitely had a massive influence on that, absolutely, as, as he would in any situation, as he has in England, of course. But I think even before he was there, there were key figures. And I think Ranić is definitely one of them. And what he's done at Leipzig is create a school of thought that I think has been followed by a lot of other people. And yeah, I mean, Jesse Marsh is not having the easiest of times at the moment, but you can see it's clear which way he wants to coach. <clears throat> Um, I guess I'll jump in here real quick. Um, so on the topic of, um, you know, we talked a little bit about Ralph Ragnick and, and, you know, the coaching development. I think obviously there's a lot of coaches on the call as well. So maybe it would be interesting just to talk a little bit about that in terms of, you know, obviously Red Bull has been a, I, I know, you know, for the, for the people that are familiar or aren't familiar, Red Bull is kind of a controversial um, <laughs> topic in Germany because of the 50 plus one rule and um, basically the fact that the clubs are maintained, they generally need to be maintained um, their ownership structure with the fans, uh, although there are some exceptions. Um, so, and a lot of the coaches that are now working in the Bundesliga, um, you know, Hansi Flick, Julian Nagelsmann, Oli Glasner, um, Marco Rosa now at Dortmund, you know, there's a big, big, um, you know, connection of some of the up and up and coming young coaches in Germany to Red Bull. I guess it would be maybe good to just talk a little bit about their history, their rise a little bit, and and you know some of the you know things that you discussed a little bit in the book, Helmut Gross, uh, and the kind of progression and and the progressive ideas that have uh, <coughs> yeah. kind of taken over not just Germany but also uh, to a certain extent around the world um, in in the in the game. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Leipzig <clears throat> obviously built off the Red Bull model, I think, which is, you know, seen in other clubs run by Red Bull as well. I think they want to play a specific type of football. Helmut Gross talked about controlling chaos. You know, they want chaos, but they want to control it. <clears throat> I think that's the key. You want to get into situations where you can manipulate the opposition. You require specific levels of fitness. You require specific levels of targeting in certain areas. You know, Ranik always used to talk about the nine seconds after you won the ball back. 
within nine seconds, you should be having a shot on target. You know, and that tells you, I think, everything about the amount of vertical passes that you want your team to play. I think a lot of German teams are taking cues from that. They're certainly looking at ways in which they can manipulate space. Football is always about that, but particularly in this area of transition, but not being so one-dimensional that you're only going to score when you don't have the ball. I think there was a, a period of time where I thought a lot of teams following the Red Bull model would say, oh, well, we only want to play in games where we have 30% possession so that we can counter, not counter-attack, but we can counter <clears throat> back when we win the ball back. <clears throat> and I think that's a dangerous way to play because ultimately you need the ball to score. They have recognized that, they've adapted that, they've moved forward with it. I think a lot of managers fell in love with the idea of controlling that chaos. They do have a very specific <clears throat> way of playing. And obviously the club is, as you said, had controversial in the way that it's gone around building itself. It doesn't really follow the rest of the German model. But because of that, it is allowed to do things that other clubs are not allowed to do, as it were. It doesn't have history or tradition per se, so it's not bag weighed down by that. So it does have more of a clean slate. They are very big into development, um, but not really internally. They prefer to look at players like Naby Keita or Emil Forsberg or Yusuf Falsen, who have what they like to call high upside, lots of potential. <clears throat> There's a formula that he uses that I can't recall, but it's effectively suggesting that you want to be buying players that have greater potential and the attitude to commit to that potential than players who arrive with higher level of ability. Because what you're looking for is investment in players who are willing to invest in your project. And if you look at most of the players that Leipzig have recruited, you'll see that that's kind of been the deal. You know, Emil Forsberg is an example. <clears throat> There's a player who didn't do very much pressing when he was playing in Sweden, came to Leipzig, he accepted that that was something he would have to improve on and is now one of their better players. The same with Paulsen, the same with Naby Keita in midfield. You know, there are small tweaks to this, the style of play that these individuals have made that Leipzig have enabled because of their approach. I think a lot of coaches are keen on the individual sense of development that Leipzig has enabled by their approach. And a lot of them, as you said, have worked in that family. Um, it does come with some potential pitfalls. And that is, of course, everybody plays the same way or at least wants to play the same kind of football. And that is dangerous for the culture of German football generally because you do want ideas from elsewhere. I think the best coaches are willing to find that and to go and look outside their own ideas and their own territory. So that's something they have to be wary of. You can't just expect coaches to pursue the same avenue each time uh, and have different results because ultimately that's not what you're going to get. I, have, I think you can see in the history of Leipzig, the very small and short history of, of Leipzig, the difference though, that there are, there are very small changes between Ranić when he was in charge and then Hasenhutl uh, and then... Nagelsmann and now Marsh, there, there are, in essence, it feels like the same model and it, and it is, but there are small differences. And, and Nagelsmann even recognised that he couldn't just play transition football. He needed to balance the two. As you were saying, Paul, you can't just have one style. You do need to have both. Um, and I think it's finding the right time in games to strike that balance. I think that's really the hard part and where the coach comes in. So... Yeah, I do think Leipzig have something to bring to the table in terms of educating coaches and bringing certain types of football to the fore. I think there are bigger question marks about what they are doing as a football club in terms of entering a space in Germany, which is built off of tradition and history um, and fan ownership and, and membership. I think that's a bigger question mark. But in terms of opportunity and facilities and coaching and for coaches, um, there's no doubt that they've had a big impact on coach development, but also on the style of play in gym. Yeah, I had a, 
a question um, in regards to talking about the pro level and, and where we're seeing the styles of play change and how do you see how that kind of translates into the youth level and how they're looking to work with their youth programs and how they're kind of coaching those teams and those clubs in order to kind of fit those styles of play? Thanks, Trey. Yes, good question. Um, that's something that they've definitely had to battle with over the years. I think one of the things that they saw in Russia was that they didn't have very many players who were good in one-on-one -on -one situations and they needed to make those changes. And, you know, how do you make a change like that, knowing that it may take 10, 15 years before it bears any fruit, right? Because ultimately it's going to take a long time. I think one of the things that they've done is over the last few years, <clears throat> they've realized that they need to make youth football less competitive and more fun, which sounds basic, but in terms of details, there's a game that was invented by Horstwein Faninho, which was developed by Matthias Lochmann in Germany. The idea is you have two teams of three, you're trying to attack and defend two goals on a much smaller pitch. Like I think the, it's like two meters by one meter goal on a pitch of like 32 by 25. I know that that's meters and that might not work in terms of conversion, but you know what I mean? It's small. Um, what you're encouraging there is you're not encouraging a situation where you have under nines where the left back may get like three touches on a Saturday or a Sunday. And the rest of the time, they're just running around aimlessly. You're encouraging a situation where all the kids touch the ball more. You get the kids scoring goals, which, let's be honest, at nine, it's all you really want to do. You encourage more fun. You encourage more spatial awareness because the pitches are smaller. The goals are smaller. You have to be aware of what people are doing. Um, and because if you do this in this style, you create it more like an event or a competition over a weekend, not in leagues. It's less about, did we win on Saturday? Have we got three more points? Are we climbing the table? So that has a massive knock-on effect for the first team. If you, make, if you recognize that you need players who are good in one-on-one -on -one situations, what do you do? You need to develop situations where your young players are touching the ball more often and finding themselves in a situation where they're confronted by one-on-one -on -one situations. You do that by changing the game, the dimensions of the field, and this game is the perfect way to do that. The, the DFB, the German FA, have started to implement this in certain areas. They're trying to do it slowly <clears throat> to test it out to begin with. And I think the knock-on effect of that is that in 10, 15 years, we're going to see more players who are not afraid of taking on those individual situations. You can see it in different cultures as well. You know, Germany doesn't have that many cage footballers. But in England, a lot of young players, they'll play in cage footballs, which are football pitches, which is basically like these outdoor places but with sort of like roofs on them and small goals um you have to play it's like street basketball you know you're encouraged to play and take on people <clears throat> and that kind of factor is something that's very hard to replicate inside academies <coughs> with a league structure and saturday focus i think if you recognize and see a weakness in the first team you have to recognize that the best way to do that is from the ground up and um this way is definitely an effective way of making sure ultimately young people have more touches of the ball. They're not wasting their Saturday, in inverted commas, by spending 30 minutes running around and not touching it um, or sitting on the bench because everybody gets, gets involved. Once you score, the person who scores comes off and gets substituted. You know, like there's, there's a constant rotation. Um, and with a smaller pitch size and smaller goals, spatial awareness has increased one-on-one -on -one skills are increased. So there are many different ways you can change the setup of a game to be more advantageous. But I think that's one thing they've recognized that they needed to change. Uh, the next big thing for them will be how they solve their striker issue. <laughs> they don't have enough strikers um, and they want someone like a number nine. So they, they want that now and they have to figure out the best way to do that. But <clears throat> in terms of youth football, that's been the most effective way that I found in my research. So Jonathan, right now, the, the DFB, in regards to like Fanino, they are, they're implementing it through uh, festivals or is it something, are they, are they laying down the structure well, of the club? Yeah, I mean, they're definitely it? laying down structure. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a thing where they're looking into areas. I think they're testing it more in the South at the moment, but they've, like I said, they're recognizing that they need to make changes to youth football because 
you know, the battlefields are slightly different in European soccer than they are in North America. Um, you have already <clears throat> participation numbers through the roof. You're not fighting with other sports really um, to take place on the weekend. Yeah. The costs are not anywhere near the same, um, if at all, a problem in Europe. So you are already at an advantage in many respects because you have more people involved. But more people does mean more people will miss out. So more children involved means inevitably there'll be more kids sat on the sidelines thinking, why am I not playing? So you need to address that. This game is addressing that. And the biggest issue, I think, personally, other than, well, the biggest issue is fun and, and more contact time with the ball for the kids. But the other issue is, of course, coaches who see youth coaching as a step to first team coaching. And I think there has to be a conscious awareness of clubs who appoint coaches and say, look, if you're doing this for your career, then this is an error. You know, if your career develops as a result of this, that's fine. But coaches cannot use <clears throat> under nines, under 12s as a platform because then it becomes about you as a coach and not about the kids. And that is a problem <clears throat> because the kids are then suffering as a result of that. Um, and I think the, the Fernino approach removes that element to a certain degree because it's just, you know, you're talking about events, competitions that are, I can't remember the, the amount of time, um, but it's something like, I want to say something like once a month or twice a month, maybe something like that, but I'm not sure. So you're still training and having that, but you get people together, like you all go to one stadium um, and you all come together to, to play like a competition event, like a big day out. And you get that. Um, interaction and exchange but you don't have a table you don't have this sense of we need to keep climbing we need to win games um which i think has been ingrained in across football across the world really um i would i would say that that we we have probably 50 different cultures in our in our country right? <laughs> yes we have a lot of different cultures in our country where it is and like i'm imagining like germany and they're looking right next door to them and seeing belgium right, who, are, who revamped back in probably 20 years ago as well, right? And of course, the Netherlands, who are always looking to innovate, and they're seeing all these things that are done in the youth. So it's really, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Spain and Fanihino, and they, they were doing Fanihino in Spain for the last 30 years as, as part of their, their culture, right? And if you if you're tracking those, tracking that back and connecting those dots backwards, you're thinking that they because the horse was calling it brain games, right? Absolutely. And so yeah. do you think that those games 20, 30 years ago is what helped this generation of Iniestas and Javis and everyone else? Almost certainly. I mean, it it plays a role along with the Barcelona team. It was coached by Pep and Xavi and Iniesta and La Masia, the way that Barcelona developed young players. I I think that combined with Fernino plays a big role <clears throat> in Barcelona. That, that team was probably one of the greatest club teams of all time, if not the greatest. So that obviously has an impact on the way football in that country was played. I think the hardest thing with things like this is that it takes a long time <clears throat> to see the fruits of your work. And I'm curious to see that in 10, 15 years, what will happen to German footballers if they go too much the other way, um, and you've got too many players who want to take on three players. Um, but each culture in Europe has learned from one another, but also respected and understood the way to develop that is the most appropriate for them inside their, their culture. And one thing that's striking for me is that the Netherlands, for example, is always trying to innovate, like you said, but part of the reason for that is because they recognize that they're a very small country and they are therefore competing against, <clears throat> in their eyes, basically a, a mammoth like Germany. And yet they're still doing great work. So sometimes being small is not always a, a disadvantage. You just have to find the right way to make that work for you. Germany has the challenge that it's <clears throat> a big country with lots of people who want to play football, lots of people who want to coach. And they're also under the spotlight in many respects because they've won the World Cup recently and because their coaching system is so revered you know they have to they have to find uh, a way to stand out and be successful um 
but that brings its own issues and you have to balance the two you know you can't win everything all of the time even if that's what you say you want to do so how do you make the most of the situation um they have to see they have to see how it works but um patience is not always the most common virtue in football so <laughs> we'll see but it definitely takes a long time these these kind of changes take a long time to implement you have to be willing to see it through um Matthias, who I had the fortune of speaking to for the book, he, he, it took him a long time to get to the table with the DFB. I mean, he's been working really hard with this idea for a really long time, been doing a lot of research. And, you know, hats off to people like that who have put the time into research and find ways to make the game beneficial for the top of the pyramid, as it were, but also, most importantly, in my opinion, um, less professional, shall we say, for young people who I think for as long as possible should be kept young. Um, that is another conversation itself, but I think the balance between professionalism and enjoyment is not always one that's well kept in Europe. Um, and you have to find a way in which to keep kids interested in the sport and not just see it as a profession from the age of 12, because I think that's dangerous and also there are a number of examples that show that some of the most talented athletes in the world were children who played six, seven different sports until they were teenagers. So there is something to be said about learning different types of agility and movement and not just focusing on one thing. Um, because that is, it's also not the best use of your childhood, shall we say. There are other ways you can learn and live and grow. It doesn't have to just be football all the time or whatever the sport. Um, and sometimes the best footballers or the best tennis players are people who played lots of other sports. Jonathan, this is Gareth Glick. I had a quick question for you just based off of what you were talking about and, and the conversations just connecting the idea of, you know, with the Nino and, and festivals and then kind of yep. this flexible nature of what we've talked about with Pep Guardiola and how the, he's taken the the – Kind of more structured German system and become much more flexible in how they play. Mm. How much do you think? Obviously, Germany's adopting kind of the, this model that provides players more freedom, allows them to play kind of without fear of results and standings, like you talked about being judged by by parents, by coaches, whoever it is on the sideline. Mm. But so, at what age then is Germany, like you're just talking about there, starting to within their academies worry about results, worry about <laughs> um, the the <clears throat> of the game and, and yep. is, it, is it too early is it too late like what does that look like within germany right now because i think this is a conversation within our own our own uh, communities here yeah that's a great question guys thank you um i think germany still has some of the concerns that a lot of other countries in the world have um i think results matter i've seen under 12s under 13s and those results still matter in professional clubs <clears throat> that i've seen i think that's still a problem um I think the Fernino battle, as it were, is still being waged. So I think we won't see the full results of that <clears throat> for a while. I think that's an ongoing situation. But I think it's a very fine line. Um, I think in Germany at the moment, uh, there are still too many clubs that have this focus uh, from the ages of under 12, under 13, under 14. But from the people I've spoken to in those environments, there is probably something that you all can relate to a lot of pressure from <clears throat> upstairs to deliver players. And I think that's something that is common the world round. I don't know if that can be changed <clears throat> based on the nature of football and the largely, at least here, free market economy, overdrive capitalism that we find ourselves in in European football. I don't know if that can be changed because the pressure is always going to be there to deliver, whether it's 12 year olds to under 14s, 14s to 16s, 16s to 18s. I think that's going to be a problem for a long time. I think clubs who take bold steps and make bold decisions will benefit in the end because everyone can't keep doing the same thing and expect the same results. That is literally the definition of madness. And you can't have that many children constantly falling away because inevitably they will. Um, and a, not look after them, but B, have a system that is designed for the few, as it were. I spent some time a couple of years ago in Sweden um, 
I know you asked specifically about Germany, but there was a club there who has done some very interesting work in this in this area. And one of the guys there, um, AIK is the club. One of the guys there told me this very funny story where he said, one of the funniest things I've ever heard about youth football is it's like everybody putting eggs in a plastic bag. One of them is hard boiled. All the other ones are normal. Throwing it against the wall and picking up the one that didn't break and saying, look, it works. And honestly, so long as one or two players make the first team, that is a model I fear that will continue. Because what we don't talk about is the cost of those one or two players, all of the other kids that don't make it. Now, I'm not saying you have to have an academy that has a 90% success rate because we all know that's not going to happen. But there has to be a, a greater appreciation for what does your duty of care look like when those kids leave? What does it look like when they're there? How do you treat your pathways in terms of is it purely we're just playing so you can get further along um, or are we here so we can develop you as people as well because we recognize the situation that you're in? Um, can we keep you in the same social groups because we recognize at that stage, 13, 14, 15, that is probably one of the most important things in your life or are we going to break that up because we think you have a career in professional soccer ahead of you and therefore we're willing to risk that? Do we recognize the factors that may be affected as a result of that decision um all questions that clubs need to ask themselves and i don't know whether all clubs are asking themselves those questions i think there are good people in often working in these situations there are good people who are struggling to make a difference because of the structures within which they operate um i think germany is no different to a lot of other countries uh, i think there are some clubs who are looking into the, the way in which they can reduce the early age of specialization. There's a lot of evidence that suggests, I personally believe this makes sense based on the people I've spoken to and the things I've read, that 13 and 14 is the, is the age in which you might start to say to them, how do you feel about it? But again, the broaching of that question is all about the autonomy for the child. For the teenager so if for example at 13 or 14 you see a player that has a certain amount of potential there's definitely a situation there where you could say look how often do you want to train you train five times a week great do you want to train twice a week great you get them to make a decision about the course of their life as it were because it's essentially what it is um rather than putting it on on them and saying this is what's going to happen i think if they have more control uh in the right environment that's a positive thing I think if they're encouraged to play lots of different sports and take up different activities in terms of hobbies, whether it's music or acting or whatever it is, um, that's a positive thing. All of those things have positive um, influences on their performance. That sounds silly because it's not like if they're in the gym, their, fit, their muscle will be greater, their, their cardio will be greater, that we can see this tangibly. This is more about character. This is more about um, personal development and also just not specializing so early. I think there are many number of positives to that approach, but that's a very big answer. Um, I think Germany has demons to fight uh, like any other European country. Um, and I think they will have to face the consequences of having a system that at the moment, I think is still too weighted towards tables um, at that age group. But like I said, I know good people who are working in those structures who find it difficult, but are finding ways um, to develop the kids as kids, um, as well as giving them opportunities to, to play soccer in an environment where they don't feel or he takes as much of that pressure off them as possible. Um, at a certain point, they're going to feel it by the time they get into 16s. You know, if it's serious at that point, you know, it's hard to keep that stuff away. But at 16, you're probably going to have a conversation about, well, if you are serious about this, we can go down this route sort of thing. Um, I think that's kind of the turning point for sure. That sounds really late because some players play first team football at 17, but I think we have to ask ourselves again what I said earlier, the cost of that. You know, I think it makes more sense to take more time, give kids a little bit more freedom in their development. So um, I think there are countries better, in Germ better than Germany in Europe who are doing this kind of thing. I think Sweden is one of them. I think one of the reasons for that is because they're a smaller country and the smaller sample size is more advantageous if you have smaller environment it's easier to contain it and manage it 
uh, than than bigger countries and bigger cultures. Um, but I think Germany has yeah some some work to do in that area. That was a really long answer. I apologize, but lots to say about it. <laughs> That's great. We got we got some good questions here um, from Everett. Everett, do you want to jump on and ask yourself? Do you want me to ask it for you? Yeah, I can. Uh, I can ask the question. Um, my question was, what is the the if you can describe the German coaches courses to like. Um, where their what the expectation is and what their focus is on for for their youth coaches in in from UEFA C to UEFA A or even the UEFA Pro license. Yeah, Everett, that's a good question. I mean, the C and A details those are ever changing. The last time I was there, they were making more changes to that approach um, so that it can be more open as it were i spent a lot of time focusing on the pro license um for the book and and the work i had spoke the people i'd spoken to for that work um that has changed as well um but basically what you're looking at is a structure at the top of the pyramid in terms of the pro license where you're it, i mean originally i think it was every year now it's offered every two years um and they have 12 rather than 24 coaches who take on that pro license so it's a smaller field. One of the things they want to do is rather than give everyone the best license, they want to make sure that the people who are going to actually use that license are the ones who are applying for the job. Because I think part of the issue is there are 56 jobs in the top three divisions in Germany where you require that, that license, the, the Fußballlehrer, the top one. And there's something like eight, 900 guys who have it. Well, that's not a problem per se, but um, it does mean a lot of guys are really well qualified um, to do jobs that they may be overqualified for, you know, and we come back to specialization. Do you want coaches to be very good at under 19s? Yes, that is something that is very valuable. Do they then need to also coach first teams? I don't know. That's up for clubs to decide, but I think they have made a decision that they want to concentrate more specifically on pathways for coaches rather than everyone getting top badges. You know, they want people to be all right, you want to coach youth football uh, under 16s? We're going to give you the opportunity to focus specifically on that and develop it. I think they've made a conscious decision to make sure that they have a greater uh, focus <clears throat> on that. At the top, I think they've also reduced it from 11 months to nine months. So it's a bit more of a compact course. Um, but that was also impacted by COVID because I think they realized they needed a little bit more flexibility. People needed a little bit more time. They couldn't always be there. Some of that stuff could be done virtually. Um, but also, you know, Sometimes stretching things out at the top level is not always necessary. You can do it in a shorter amount of time. But um, yeah, I think the, the biggest change, I think, across the board, whether it's top license or the way down, is this idea of developing um, competence or, or, and also this like personal approach for coaches. You know, they definitely want to develop. Um, I think they had a, a period of time where they're developing coaches who are very good tactically. I think they want to develop a lot more communicative skills now. They want to have coaches who are aware of how to speak, body language, how to hold a dressing room. Not that that wasn't being done before, but I think they want that to trickle down a little bit more. And we were talking about spe specifics. So if you're an under 16 coach, we want to talk about how you would connect with that generation. You know, I think there's a greater consideration for how to approach and speak to people who were born after 2000. Terrifying thought. Um, <laughs> but I think there's definitely a, a greater focus on specificity in those areas. Um, and also just incentivizing youth coaches. I think they're looking towards moving to, to getting a model which gives greater financial reward to youth coaches because they recognize that a lot of people see it as a stepping stone partly because it's not well paid. Um, giving them more specific education so that they can feel more uh, at home in that space. Um, and also just greater appreciation. I mean, you know, we all need a pat on the back at the end of the day sometimes, but if you are the under 16 coach and all everybody is talking about is the first team coach, that can get demoralizing. So. I think they are making specific changes. They are also trying to tie together modules so that it's not isolated silos of like fitness and tactical and technical. They're trying to bring them together. They want to make it more of an ecosystem on a specific level so that coaches can be aware of how those things work in unison. And it's not just like, go spend some time with a fitness coach, go do tactical, tactical over there. You know, it's a greater understanding of like, well, if you move like this, this impacts your ability to play this type of football and therefore those things mesh together. Um, so I think there are big changes uh, across 
across the board, but specifically at the top level, I think there's recognition that they want fewer people to do it. That sounds like elitist, but actually they're trying to specify more down the modules so that you don't have everybody just doing C to do A to do top license, you know, like that there's a more specific pathway for coaches so they can say, hey, look, I want to coach youth football. I'm very passionate about this level of coaching. Then there's a clear pathway for you to do that with the right amount of incentives and education along the way. Um, yeah, I think I think that's a benefit. I think it's a good thing. I think a move towards communication and more personal factors is also a good thing. They're recognizing that it's not just about tactics or technical, that there's also a way and a manner in which you communicate your body language, your tone of voice. And as I say, connecting with different generations, I think that's something that they absolutely need to, to check on um, and different cultures as well. So yeah, I think there are changes. I think um, one of the biggest things that may be a surprise to people is that the, at the top, the, the, the top coaching badge, there's a UEFA minimum. I can't remember what it is. It's something like 200 hours, I think, um, that you have to do in terms of education for the top badge. And in Germany, it's 800. So they, they have gone way beyond the minimum amount of hours of study required for the top level badge. And I asked the guy at the time who was running it, Frank, um, and he said, look, if we're going to do something right, we're going to do it, we're going to do it properly. You know, we, we want to do it the right way. And I think obviously Germany has made, has the platform to do that because of the facilities and the funding in place. And that's always, that's not always the case for smaller countries um, or smaller federations. But I think that is also a representation of the commitment that Germany has to the breadth of education. You know, there is no shortcut. There is no corner or stone unturned when it comes to getting this top badge. And I think all of the coaches who leave that space certainly feel like they're equipped with all of the tools to be able to do the job. Now, they're not telling people to be a certain type of person, you know, personality training, this is not. But it is giving you the opportunity to find out what kind of coach you want to be. Not everybody can be Jurgen Klopp. But that doesn't mean you need to be Jurgen Klopp to be successful. So whoever you are and however you want to coach, you arrive at this stage with that personality set and your feeling about football, your philosophy of football. And you're given the opportunity to explore it in all the areas so that you really feel like you come out of it. And I think that 800 hours example is kind of the best indication of how thorough the course is in Germany. Um, the fact that they have made changes in the last three or four years shows to me that they're also willing to stay up to date and evolve um, because that's important, especially when it comes to coaching. You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, so yeah, I think there are more specifics that you can look into. Um, but I think that kind of a hope, at least, that gives you uh, an overview of the of the changes, um, but also the situation from mostly at the top, but um, specifically those changes over the last few years. Hey, Jonathan, um, thanks for taking the time today to, to talk to us. Um, you spoke a little bit about players, young players playing different sports to for them to enjoy obviously their football their soccer and have the um I, I guess free time to enjoy other sports too but I guess what have you noticed in maybe German coaches or culture that helps develop that winning mentality not that winning is the most important but the, yeah. the willingness to compete and to is there something that you've noticed that they do at a young age that translates to I mean, you know when they get older Oh, that's a good question. I think certain clubs have certainly ingrained it better than others. I think sometimes you can sell an idea of winning mentality if you have it supported by your achievements. Um, it's one of the reasons that Bayern Munich is able to do it so well, for example, because it's a lot easier to say we need to have a winning mentality if you can stand in front of lots of winning <laughs> in the form of trophies, as it were. Um, I... I don't know whether it's something specific to Germany in terms of how to encourage winning in that environment, but I have found some of the most effective ways is to make, especially kids, to make it feel like the person that they're playing with is so important. The bond between young people is never to be underestimated. And I think you'll find that young people are willing to sacrifice more in a sporting arena if they feel that the the person next to them is someone that they value and they feel is also going to do the same. I think if clubs, and there are, you know, when young people play football in Germany, it's predominantly through clubs. They don't play for their schools or colleges, really. Um, there is certainly a sense of 
who are you playing for? You know, a lot of people on my year abroad, I had the opportunity to play for a reserve team in a very small town. And I watched the first team. And even in this small place, you get the feeling it's clear that you're representing a community. <clears throat> and that means something. Um, and I think that base level gives people the opportunity to really engage with why they play the sport. As for a fine-tuned level of winning, um, I think that comes through sheer competitiveness of having to beat so many other people to the professional game. I think a lot of young people here, if they do make it, they are aware of how much sacrifice they've had to make to be able to get to it. And I also think that the better clubs have recognized that the passing down of messages and values is not to be underestimated. I think if you're a young player who comes to Bayern Munich, for example, there are many players in which you have seen over the history of that club sacrifice themselves to win. Those messages will have been passed down to the present team and then they're passed on to you. I think there's definitely a feeling there that you, know, you are fortunate to be where you are, but you have to make the most of it. Um, I think at a, at a youth level, it's harder. You have to fine-tune the two, um, finally balance the two, sorry. <clears throat> and I don't know whether instilling a ruthless winning mentality in young people is healthy. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I think the balance between relationships and the, the, the outcome is key. Like if you can feel like <clears throat> the person next to you matters and you're willing to sacrifice something, you'll find that the feeling that you get is greater than just being like, oh, we won, but I don't have a bond with another person. I think the determination of individuals is affected by a myriad factors that you can't just hone down to one thing. I don't think coaches are doing one thing and therefore making more determined kids. I don't think it works like that. Um, I think you can have environments which reflect uh, greater tenacity. I always believe the environment reflects leadership. And if you don't have an environment that makes people feel like this is a space I need to be committed in, I need to be disciplined in, but I can also have fun in and there's a bond here, then it's very hard, I think, to create a level of determination that you're looking for. So the environment is probably the most important thing. And I think as for individual levels of winning mentality, I think that comes later uh, when things get a little bit more serious. And then as a result of former players, club values and, uh, and relationships with with teammates. Thank you. Jonathan, we, uh, we touched on this in our previous conversation about like countries like Uruguay, right? Or Brazil, right? Or Mexico, right? They all have a different culture of development. And in Uruguay, you know, they have the baby leagues where the kids are, you know, people around the crowds and, and going out after it at age six, seven, right? That's their culture. Brazil's culture is maybe, you know, it's heavily influenced by futsal at the early ages, right? Um, what, what is, you know, what, what is, do you think that there's some guiding principles to the German youth football? Um, in what they're doing and do you think it is at a at, at a high level in Europe do you think it's or who do you think in Europe is is really leading the way you mentioned like Sweden but yeah I think when it comes to youth football it's very difficult because what's the barometer of leading the way is it the number of players that are making the first team you know <clears throat> or is it something else <clears throat> I think that's the hard part I think what do you measure that success by I think Germany is doing some good work in that area, but I don't think it's doing anything necessarily outstanding. I think they've had a lot of years of history where they've done outstanding work. If you are taking first team players as a measure of success, I mean, any country, I was just talking about this today with a colleague of mine, any country that can go from Mateus to Balak to Ozil to Muziala, basically in the same position, must be doing something right, you know, because those are effectively generational talents, you could argue, um, generational players that don't come around very often. And yet it seems like every single generation, Germany has a player in certain positions, in this case, in the 10 or the eight, that just 
is so good it could they could play for anyone anywhere so they are obviously doing things right at a youth level in terms of first te- first team player production and i think as we mentioned earlier the 2014 world cup success is an example of that you know you don't get to the end of the rainbow without putting the ground in so the groundwork in first um and they did do that i think the greatest challenge for them now is how do you get back you know what changes do you make yeah okay we talked about that earlier as well the idea of bringing in more players who are capable of taking things on one on one um so but so, I, I don't know whether there's someone who's necessarily standing again who's standing out in terms of that success because i don't know whether necessarily the best measure of that success is the number of players in the first team well i think it's probably the most commonly used one because obviously you know academies the purpose of academies people will say are ultimately to produce players for the first team i have always believed especially learning from people much smarter than i am that if an academy is to develop young people and talented players um and the byproduct of that is players who make the first team then that is a healthier approach than having an academy whose sole aim is to produce players for the first team and the byproduct of which is good human beings who are also good at football i think if your sole aim is to produce well grounded individuals who are very capable at the sport that they're playing and the knock on effect of that is that they make the first team then great because what you're doing there is you're putting the focus on a different area and a, and for me a more important area um and it feels like a win-win situation because you're saying all right these are the values of the club these are the values of the the nation and we want them incorporated in our young people okay so you find people who know how to do that you create an environment in which that culture is not something that's just talked about or put on the walls but it's something that is lived on a daily basis through interactions through use of language and then you create a training structure which challenges these young individuals and to in a way that they feel comfortable but also in a way in which they feel like they're learning and developing and at the end of that if you can say by the way we think that these two or three players are probably capable of playing in the first team then great if however your structure is designed to strictly say okay every year you need to deliver four players to the first team this this and this we're not really that bothered about values like that can come as a secondary part i think that's a dangerous road to go down i understand each club has its approach but personally i think the healthier way to do it is the former um and that's why i don't know whether there are specific examples in terms of a nation that are doing things better than others because it's so specific to smaller cultures yeah you know you you're talking about smaller environments i think there are towns and cities and clubs even smaller than that that are doing a really good job does that mean the country's doing a great job i don't know um i think it's much much harder on a national level because ultimately to make a national team you probably need to be a little bit more ruthless with numbers okay so let me ask you this okay so the definition of success maybe you know you mentioned your know, players into the first team but maybe maybe yeah. that that definition of success is like just a vibrant soccer culture right where yeah. they just love football they just love football they love playing football they're growing they're developing they're going to college they're going here they're, but they're playing for life right yeah they're playing soccer for life um do you feel like um there are clubs in germany that and they're developing players obviously doing a good job of developing are there clubs in germany or are there towns in germany are there smaller areas in germany that that stick out as hot spots you know as far as develop because i'm 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 speaking of this like say houston right yeah houston we have 8 million people so we are the size of a country right yeah but yeah. what i'm really really interested in is hot spots right where there's really healthy environments of of football And do you feel that comes from like a federation or do you feel it comes from just the people inside of a club? I think it comes from the people inside of a club. I don't think federation I think federation will, federations will set ground rules or set parameters in which clubs and individuals can operate, but I think a lot of the time the greatest influence comes from people on the ground because they know the community <clears throat> better than anyone else i don't think anyone should come into a space like that particularly from a federation and say hey guys look this is the way to do it um i think that's difficult i think you can bring ideas but you need to make sure you include people who understand the area i don't think it makes any sense to insert something into a space without considering whether it even fits in the first place um it's hard to say 
I mean, there are a couple of clubs, but again, who's developing players at a great rate in terms of, you know, youth academies? Well, a lot of teams have a great record. I mean, everyone will talk about Borussia Dortmund, but a lot of those players are players that are coming from England or from France um, because they know they get the opportunity. And I think that's something we haven't really talked about, but I think context, again, is really important in Germany. Who's the best at developing young players? Well, probably every single Bundesliga team, first team, <laughs> because the whole system in Germany is built off opportunity. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of important in, in the debate around context. You're talking about hotspots. Every single team has their own sense of who they are and what they want to do. Take Whether it's Freiburg, for example, they've had the same head coach for a very, very long time, Christian Streich. He totally understands that community and he's able to engage with them in a way that no other coach could. I mean, he used to play for the team. He knows, this, he knows that town. He knows the city. Um, he knows the first team. He knows the reserve teams. He used to coach the under-19 teams. And this is something else. But, you know, context, again, I can't stress this enough. The value of youth coaching in Germany is so important in a way that I don't think is, in value, is valued in almost any other country. And the reason for that is because, pro, is because youth football is effectively pro football in terms of its level. The only difference there is obviously player wage and quality. But everything else in terms of training and approach is very professional. So if you coach 200 under-19 games, that means something. You can go into a job interview and say, hey, look, and people will respect that. Obviously, that has to come from cultural changes over the years. Klopp, Tuchel, you know, gave clubs permission to appoint internally. But the point I make is clubs have seen that their area can be a hotspot if they allow it to develop because they have recognized that everywhere, in, a, in essence, in Germany, is an opportunity. Everyone gets the opportunity to coach. Everyone gets the opportunity to play. The reason that Germany is so good at what it does is because it lets people do those things. You know, it doesn't say, oh, we need to send you out on loan or you need to go coach somewhere else. There's certainly a recognition of, or a willingness to give people the opportunity to succeed. I, I think that matters. Um, I think having youth football at that level matters. Um, and I think <clears throat> that's given smaller communities license to be bolder and to be more creative. Um, Look at, I mean, Mainz is a great example. Mainz is a tiny club that no one would know about were it not for their coaching development. I mean, you want to talk about player development. Mainz has developed some of the best coaches in the world. Jürgen Klopp came from Mainz. Thomas Tuchel came from Mainz. Bo Svensson, the coach who's there now, ironically was coaching in a club that was following a similar system to Red Bull, but has come through, used to play for Mainz, and is now coaching there. He looks set to go on to do great things already. Um, that's a, that's a team that is, and a club that is not afraid to give young players, but also young coaches um, opportunities. And I think each club in Germany has recognized that they can reflect their culture in a way that, that works for them and, and in a way that they can be successful. Um, it gets harder when you get onto a federational level, when you get into a bigger level. And that's not to say that other countries aren't doing that, but I think there's definitely a difference in terms of opportunity in a way that you don't see in other places. Um, I think it's a foundational piece in Germany, opportunity, um, because without that, you, you can't, how do you grow anything if you don't give people the chance for, for it to happen? I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest things for me. Um, but it's a good question, you know, which club is doing the best in terms of development? Um, like I said, I, yeah, it's a hard one for sure, because I mean, there are lots of clubs doing good things, but uh, I think, you had a club like Schalke who had one of the best records of youth development. Mamon Neuer came from there. Ozil came from there. Um, there are a whole list of players who came through Schalke's youth academy. They had, and the reason, partly, is because they're one of the best youth coaches in Norbert Elgert who didn't want to coach at another level, who recognized he was very good at that level. And according to most of the players who've played there, he taught them a lot about football, but a lot about life. And a lot of the reasons that I think a lot of those young guys have gone on to play first team football is because of the nature and the environment of the academy that he generated. Now, Schalke is struggling in the second division because of issues in the first team and upstairs in the boardroom and club image. But in terms of the academy, Schalke's academy will always be respected as one of the best, if not the best in Germany in terms of how many players it's brought through to the first team. Yeah. And again, that's because it recognizes that in Gelsenkirchen, in the city that uh, Schalke is based, 
it recognizes its culture. It recognizes that hardworking, working class area and the values of that area. And, and if people come into that space, there's an understanding that, you know, you are representing this community, but also there's a coach there who's willing to help you along the way, not just in a footballing sense. And I think those two things make a big difference. Um, there's always been a sense with that club that your effort matters. Um, yeah. And it is something that is tangible in the air when you're there. You know, do you work? Are you going to put the work in? Um, and I think they will always, they have always applauded players who gave effort. Um, so again, you know, hotspots, absolutely. Um, they're easier to maintain when they're smaller. But I think in Germany, the nature of opportunity means that everyone has basically had a light switched on in their head and said, hey, we have the opportunity to do something special here. I mean, I've, just in my, my trips to, to Europe and going to these different places every once in a while, you feel like you can drive down the street, you know, and hop off the exit and go have a great soccer conversation with the next club and the next coach. And they are into it, you know, like, like, you know, like a first, they're just passionate about that. Right. And that's Absolutely. the culture. That's the culture. I think that, that, you know, we're, we're striving for here in our country, you know, part of it, I mean, part of the, part of the thing and, you know, why we're all here today, we've got a bunch of, you know, we're all youth coaches, right. Um, we have Sam Snow on here. Who's a, who's a, who's a coach educator for USU soccer. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really, really neat to have that, that vibrant culture. And I can tell that, you know, when you go over to Europe, when you go to Germany and you have that sense of like, it's, it's organized, number one, right? It's a different set of organization. Yeah. And that they're just, they're just kind of constantly investing in the coaches and in the think tank and into the, the, the programming, you know? Um, and it's we have hard. a big, we have a big country here, as you know, right? Yeah. It, it, it's not a country, it's a continent, you know, <laughs> yeah. it is Europe, right? And, and that's a, kind of our big challenge is like, how do, we, how do we grapple with the size of it? And if we can't grapple with the size of it in these different kind of organizations, you know, that playing leagues and different body governing bodies, we have these, you know, it, it's big. So how do you grapple with it? So kind of my, my, my head keeps going back to developing local hotspots, you know? How do we improve locally in, in, in city by cities or regions, you know, I to, think make that's a, a, to make it a smaller country? <laughs> to, I think that's a smart way to do it. Um, I mean, you, I'm, I'm not going to tell you guys uh, how to do your jobs. You all do it very well, I imagine. Um, but the research I've done with the people I've spoken to has <clears throat> definitely given me insight into, into that idea. And I think, you know, we're in a situation at the moment in, in the world where I think we're, the world feels very small and very big at the same time. And I think this idea, you know, we're constantly being fed this idea of globalization and everything being so close. You know, we can order something from the other side of the world. It can get there in two days. I think sometimes forgetting the local community and the local space around us and the people around us is, is a big issue. Um, and the best way to connect, I know that you have to fight many battles that European soccer doesn't because you're facing also a culture war in the sense that, you know, there are sports that have taken over days of the week. There are people, most young children don't grow up of, you know, dreaming of scoring a penalty in the World Cup final. Um, you know, they dream of other things. You know, they dream of, you know, scoring a three from downtown or, you know, catching a touchdown to win the Super Bowl. And that's hard because those are things that we don't necessarily have over here. Everybody wants to be a footballer, basically. Um, so that's something that you guys are battling and I think a lot of people have respect for because that makes it harder. But I think all the more reason to focus on that local area. I, I know a lot of people who are working in structures that are, are also difficult in Europe. Not the same, definitely not the same, but also challenging in terms of who's the governing body? How do we manage this? Yeah, okay, there's a you know, greater organization because it's the number one sport on the continent, but people are still having to fight against structures but even based on their own philosophy. So they've always said, the only things I can control are the things I'm controlling. And if I can control a local community in a local area, that's my biggest win. Because the knock-on effect of that, I've always thought, 
is that more people will come. Because if you do something special on a smaller scale, people will hear about it. And people, people want to feel valued. People want to be a part of something. And I think if you're going to offer the opportunity to do something special and be a part of something that's you know, small based on the community that upholds the values and ingrains those values into everyday action and not just has values on the wall and you know, like a lot of clubs do, oh yeah, we want to win and determination. Those, those don't set you apart. You need to have things that truly set you apart and represent who you are. And then they need to be lived and embodied in everyday interaction, whether that's um, you know, through language, through communication, um, through body language, through how you move, how you greet people, whatever it is. Um, also how you train, all of those things, they need to reflect that. And when it does, people um, who are not involved in that will be like, hey, have you heard about that? Yeah, it's kind of cool, isn't it? I kind of want to be involved in that. And I, ultimately, I think that has greater value. Um, and I think sometimes coaches are not always supported in that space. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you probably feel that way. Um, maybe not. I hope not. I hope you are supported. Um, but the people I've spoken to who coach in structures that are challenging for them have always said that they've felt greater reward in the job that they're doing when they have focused on that those things that they can control and kept it local and connected to the things that are important to them and the people around them because it's a big sport and it's even bigger in, in terms of how easy it can get lost in a country like the US. Um, so, yeah, all I can say is hats off to you for doing the work you do because <laughs> it's a bigger challenge than I think in Europe in many ways because you're facing more hurdles. Um, but like I said, that focus on, on people is really the defining factor uh, as hard as it is. Um, that's, that's what sets you guys apart. And uh, if you're friends with Paul, then uh, you must be good people. So hats off. Thanks, John. Well, I mean, that was fantastic. Anybody out there, if, you, if you'd like to ask any questions at all, now's the time, you know? Um, I mean, we could talk to Jonathan, Jonathan forever. Um, any other questions out there? Shahad, any, any final, final questions, thoughts? Benny, how are you doing? Doing well, Paul. Yeah, doing well, Paul. So good to see you, my friend. And, uh, information that's been shared is, is tremendous. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm Dutch, if you didn't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, having all those, uh, all those memories going back. You know, I mean, comp competing with with the, the German uh, philosophy and and yeah. you know, and the way uh, things been shared. So, so thanks, thanks for uh, for bringing that to light. Ah, oh, thank you for those kind words. I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, I love this because we got Benny from from the Netherlands, Santiago. You on there? Santi's from Argentina. Yeah, I thought it was funny when you mentioned the baby football in Uruguay because it's the same way in Argentina like you're six years old and there's like 50 people watching you with like banners and stuff so it's a different culture and it's always cool to hear you know how it works in in other countries and we've talked about um the Belgian FA a lot and so it's really cool to to get a little bit of insight on the on the German so thank you Jonathan appreciate your time oh thank you for listening I appreciate it Jonathan, this is Trevor here. Hi, Trevor. I've um, just been speaking with some people out of Europe, uh, Netherlands, Germany, and I understand that the DFB has changed their uh, grassroots format or playing format up to 15-year-olds where they play 9v9. Do you know anything about that and why they made such a change for that um, age group? Yeah, I think part of the reason for that was recognizing that there were too many kids who were, were dropping out um, because they weren't as involved in the sport as much as they wanted to be. Um, I also think that there's a, an issue with spatial awareness when you play on bigger pitches or you play in a space that's too congested when you have too many kids running around if it's 11 by 11. Um, again, as I said earlier, if kids are touching the ball in that space, are that, how many touches are they getting inside of a, 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 a game? Is it even worth their time? Are kids on the bench? Are they involved? 
you know, have to ask yourself if they want to give up that weekend. And ultimately, if you're thinking about first team, you're thinking about development at national team level, how many of those kids are going to stay in the sport? Um, I think they made changes consciously trying to engage young people uh, and getting them playing more football. Um, I think there was a move to um, have uh, 9v9 <clears throat> because, again, you're talking, if you, it, it's a question of maybe being too early to go 11v11. Um, you're all coaches, you, you know the greater value of, of the timing of when that should happen more than I do. Um, I think there's a recognition there, especially at that age group, that they felt they wanted to delay that a little bit and have more space uh, on the field so that you could spread the play around a little bit. Um, but I think the greater change would be the Fernino change that would come in um, slightly earlier than that. Um, can also be played later, obviously. Um, there are ways in which to adapt the game for older age groups, but... Um, Anything other than that, I wouldn't necessarily know. Um, there are a lot of changes. I'm happy to admit, I'm not ashamed to admit that there, I don't know everything. Um, so any more details on the 9v9 and why they would have changed specifically, I couldn't tell you. That would be the reasons I would feel would make the most sense based on what I've been told and what I've researched from the people who are making those changes at younger um, age groups. Uh, I think that would be my indication of why they would have made those differences. But um, I'm sure that there's a more detailed answer um, and I'm sorry that I can't give it to you. Thank you. I think we Jonathan, have... Hi, it's uh, uh, Baby here. Um, hi. A question about, thank you very much. It's fascinating listening to your perspective of the German um, uh, football. Uh, I lived in England all my life, so uh, ah. across the pond, uh, the <laughs> and everything else kind of uh, resonates with the, with the English uh, uh, for that sense. Um, one thing that's kind of fascinated me, especially in the last three or four years, has been the influx of uh, young English players into Germany. And what really is fascinating is the transformation of these players uh, from Sancho being a classic example. I mean, he was, I hate to call him a nobody, but I mean, he was just one that was being Owned off by the clubs, uh, Manchester United being a you know a classic example. He's gone over to Germany. Suddenly his values exploded. Is that a, a, a intentional strategy used by the German football for development of domestic youth, uh, or is that now becoming more of an economical or a business venture? Hey, we'll take these guys. And look, Liverpool's looking at uh, a player, an English player. 19-year-old Nathan, I think his name is, um, and they're, they're looking to pay £40 million pounds for him. This is a kid who's only 19 in Liverpool talking about £40 million. Pounds. It's, it's a lot of money. So is this now becoming a strategy of, hey, let's get the English youth out or youth from across Europe, develop them, sell them for exuberant amount of money, or is there something systematic about the development of German football for the next decade to come? I... Personally, I think that that's an economic development. I think a lot of clubs have built savvy business models off of that. I think there are knock-on effects to uh, development of other players as a result of having young, talented individuals in youth setups at the under-17, under under-19 age groups, for example. <clears throat> but I think the, the obvious reason for it is uh, economic. Um, it is a business model that allows you to compete. Uh, if you can recruit young players who are not getting opportunity, we talked about opportunity earlier, if you can recruit young players who are going to be given opportunity that you see potential in and then reap the financial benefits by selling them on later on. I think that certain clubs yeah, like Bristol Dortmund um, are an example of that who have built themselves um, and their reputation after Klopp off of, off of that. Um, whether that's detrimental to their own academies, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's hard to say that that would be a detriment by bringing in someone who's of good ability, could only lift other players per se, but it depends how long they would spend in that youth environment. I, I think it's certainly 70% an economic decision, if not more. I think um, it's a business model that a lot of clubs are using. Um, 
And when you are trying to compete with clubs in England who are, let's be honest, given a boost a shot uh, of television money that you can't compete with every year, uh, I think that's probably why a lot of clubs are following that economic model. Interesting, thank you. John, do you want to ask your question, John Gallas? Jonathan, nice to meet you. Thanks for your time. Nice to meet you, John. Um, when Matthias Sammer sort of took over as a German sort of technical director after their debacle in, what was it, 06, um, the government had a major role with the DFB in sort of restructuring the national training centers, player identification, development centers. I know you, you briefly touched on it, but, and I know there's, there's cultural, you know, different assimilations and, and different cultures and, and small towns in Germany, but what role do you think federations should have in supporting sport like that and, and really, you know, propping up the federation to get in, at the club level and really support development to, in typical German fashion, you know, if they want to do something, they want to win everything all the time. Uh, and it's, you've seen it in the women's game as well. As soon as they made a commitment to, to support football at the national level, they've, they've gone on and done some amazing things. But what role do you think, you know, that should play? And then I think specific to, to Paul's comment with such a massive country that we live in, mm. it would be really nice to, to have our federation potentially support <laughs> regionally, um, you know, these training centers and, and more so than just say Kansas city, more so than just one national pool. I mean, with the, the amount of players we have in this country, I think we need to open that up and support it at a level that reflects the size of our country. So eager to hear your thoughts. Thank you, John. That's a very good question and uh, a complex question. Um, I think- I, I have nowhere to go, so <laughs> take your time. <laughs> um, I think the, the nature of uh, federations often is to come in and insert authority in spaces that they need to probably take a little bit more tack. I think the supporting of, of people who are doing work on the ground level needs to be greater. Um, I also think there needs to be, uh, whilst there will be national incentives or, or national programs, as it were, at a federational level, there also needs to be recognition of the work being done on a local level and how that could impact federational outcomes um, without coming in and saying, right, this is what we want to do as US soccer. This is what we want. We need this to be done from top down. Right. Um, I would actually spend more time on the ground recognizing the value of certain communities and say, okay, so we're looking for these types of player developments um, or these types of players, for example, or these types of coaches. Um, which areas do we think will maybe best develop that or, or better than that? Which areas, um, what are the areas bringing us? Okay, so coaches from this area will be like, we'll have this philosophy, coaches from this area, players from this area and understanding even on a country the size of America's scale, understanding that there is a deep, rich opportunity here to tap into what makes each city, each state unique in that environment, rather than saying, hey, this is an overall directive that we want to follow um, and everyone needs to fall in line. I think there's an inevitable amount of work that needs to be done um, on a national scale and you will have federations coming in and saying, look, we need to hit these um, objectives and that's always right. going to be the case wherever you are but I think more importantly if you can support more people specifically coaches um, at the local level you'll end up getting better results because the idea that everything should be some sort of pyramid, a pyramid of hierarchy is kind of broken I think now I don't necessarily always see it being the top-down model being the most effective i'm not saying it should be flat but um we all know that most things in life are not linear so why are we spending so much time trying to create a pathway from a to b when really it's probably a to c to f to d to b you know there needs to be greater recognition of a flexibility um and i think the best way to do that would be to support uh grassroots programs uh local coaches make pathways 
clearer, but also give kids and coaches greater autonomy to work within a framework that is still following the overall philosophy of the federation, but isn't losing the values and the cultures of that local community. I would prefer to see that because ultimately, what's the end product? You're going to end up with more unique styles of play and more special players in the sense that they're going to offer you something different. If you have an overall directive that everyone has to follow, <clears throat> there's a danger that everyone's going to start playing the same way or creating the same type of player. In a country like America, where there are so many different styles of play, let alone different philosophies and cultures and approaches, lean into that. <clears throat> Give it the opportunity to grow. You know, you're asking for more support there. I think it absolutely should come. If you, you, do, you don't have to have, or you certainly shouldn't have one center in a state or it, let alone in one city. I mean, obviously, you know, thinking big, big here, but yeah. there should be the oppor opportunity um, not to have to centralize everything. You know, you can see it in, in the job market in different countries. If you want to work anywhere in England, you probably got to work in London. You know, is the centralization of things a good thing? I don't know. Um, I would prefer, in terms of football development uh, sense, to see greater support of local areas and to spread things out a bit. It's only at the end that you should come together in, in centralizing things and play, when you play for the US, you know, when you reach that level. Before, you should stay connected to your, your roots for as long as possible. That's, you know, I, I think that would be a smart approach, but <clears throat> only you will know and coaches here will know whether that's feasible or not but greater organization <clears throat> at that local level will help you know if you've got fractures or different bodies or nobody knows who's taking responsibility that's a problem it does need to be clear but that doesn't mean it needs to be linear um, and it does need to be in greater support of local communities I think um, because no one should be telling you how to do your job in the sense of your community because you know it better than anyone else Thank you. Jonathan, thank you very much. This was just outstanding, outstanding. Really, really appreciate the time. Pleasure. As if you haven't, if you haven't gotten the book yet, I, <laughs> um, it really is an amazing book, a fascinating book. Um, you can actually jump around the chapters, which is what I did, Jonathan. I jumped around. Um, well, I'm grateful for, for you reading it. So I'm very grateful. It means a lot. So thank you. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it, it, I appreciate you've been so uh, generous with your time as well. You know, um, I just reached out to Jonathan on social media and uh, we, we hooked up, um, hooked up the other, the other week with Shahad and, and just so gracious with your time. We're really um, looking forward to your next project. <laughs> And your next, your next, are you writing a book right now? Or are you doing anything else? Well, right I mean, no comment. No, <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm definitely working on something at the moment, <clears throat> which isn't necessarily tied to German football, but um, is tied to a, a strand of what I was working on in Mensch, <clears throat> which is effectively an, uh, the idea that I think we've gone too far the other way in football and focused on the technical and the tactical a little bit too much. I think it has its place. I think it's important, but I think ultimately anyone will tell you that the most important thing in whatever field of life that you work in is people. And I think there's a deeper need, particularly in professional sport to develop and to nurture the human aspect of the athlete. Um, and I think there are ways in which that can be done. I think it's very specific to a local culture um, and to a club and the values that are in place there. But I think we need to be very wary of professionalism um, and its fangs because uh, it can bite hard. And I think we need to prepare people better than we are doing. But we also need to maintain that preparation throughout a professional career so that when it ends, it's not the end of a life. Uh, it's the continuation of a life. Um, so I think there are things we need to do. Uh, I've always believed that you should develop the person Uh, and then the player, that's um, a mantra that I have, even though I'm not a coach, but any coaches that I speak to, I always tell them that. Um, and that's something that I think needs to be improved on and something that I explored over the last three years. And uh, 
yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to bringing that, bringing that together and sharing it. Awesome. Shahad, do you want uh, any final words? My co-host for the day. No, uh, just again, appreciate it, Jonathan. I know it's getting late in Germany as well. <laughs> so just again, thank you for your time again and great insight. Um, having, you know, I've played in Germany and stuff like that, but it's always great to hear the fresh insight and, and in different aspects of the human element to all these things. Again, I think that's the direct translation of Mensch in uh, German is human. Um, so I think that's a great, great way to end it. Um, thanks for your time, everybody, for jumping on and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everyone sticking around and listening. Uh, really grateful. And uh, yeah, thank you. Take care thanks, of yourself. John. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.